We're going to talk this um, evening about um, gospel-centered growth. Gospel-centered growth or the doctrine of progressive sanctification. And I've alluded to this doctrine several times as we've gone through our discussion together. And now I'd like us to try to discuss it in much more detail. And hopefully from the perspective of, well, how does this actually work its way out in the local church? And uh, for those of you who are pastors, I've gotten several questions already. And they're great questions about, well, how do I actually do this in my church? How do I create the kind of environment in the church family where people want to grow and know how to grow? That, that's a great question. That tells me that you're trying to think through the doctrine of the sufficiency of God and its practical applications in real life pastoral ministry. And, and hopefully um, this particular discussion will um, help us with that matter. So um, gospel-centered growth. Yeah, we started by just asking the question, well, why is that um, doctrine um, so very important? And um, l- let me give you several possible answers to that. Yeah, one is because growth is a um, normal and expected part of life. Um, it, let me ask you to open your Bible now to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and uh, let's look at some verses of Scripture together In my mind, this is one of the most important passages in the Bible that describe um, what a church is supposed to be like, or what it's supposed to be accomplishing. And it's interesting, when you look at this passage, I think you would agree that the theme of these verses is growing. Well, if those two things are true... That on the one hand, this is the most, one of the most important passages that describes what is a local church supposed to be accomplishing. And if the theme is growing, then that would answer our question. Why is this so very, very important? But let's start in um, Ephesians chapter 4, um, oh, verse 11, where we read, And he gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastor teachers. Why? Well, for the equipping of the saints... Why? For the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the body, to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we're no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now, I I said that um, I think that the theme of this text is growing. Let's just look through it again, and let's look for how many words or phrases we can find that speak to or allude to the matter of growing in this text. For example, in verse 12, you have, "...for the equipping of the saints." The idea is that pastor teachers are leading in such a way that the people of God are growing. They're being equipped so that they could do the work of the ministry. The assumption is that as people are growing, as they're being equipped in their families, as they're being equipped in their personal lives, as they're being equipped for handling the the temptations that we face every day, etc., 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 that's then what prepares us to do the work of the ministry. So we have to be growing in order for that to happen. Then you see the next phrase, to the building up. Of the body of Christ. Now, let's say we had a thermometer and it measured the um, level of Christ's likeness in your church family. Well, if we had taken a reading six months ago and then we took another reading today, it ought to be higher. That there ought to be evidence of spiritual growth. Now, now admittedly, Hopefully, you're also seeing some men and women come to Christ, and so you're kind of adding water to the soup, so to speak. But other than that, if we're getting the job done, our church family should not be at the same level of spiritual maturity month after month after month and year after year after year. If we're emphasizing progressive sanctification, then we ought to see people being built up in the faith, just like this passage of Scripture says. Then the next verse, until we all attain to the unity of the faith. 
Here's one of the quickest ways to have a um, church that is divided. Fill it with immature people who don't want to grow. And it's amazing how many things they can fight about. It's amazing how many things they can argue about. Because they're busy thinking about how everybody else is wrong. They don't have any time to think about how they need to change. Conversely, if you're encouraging every person in the church, you need to grow. And you need to grow. And you need to grow. When I've got so much attention that I'm placing on how I need to get to a better place, I don't have a whole lot of time to worry about everybody else. And the point is, when everybody is trying to grow, then one of the net effects is unity, just like this passage of Scripture says, goes on to say, and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man. Now, the more I know about Christ, if I'm being taught correctly, the more mature I'm going to be. To the measure of stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So, well, how do I know when I no longer need to grow? When I have reached the stature of the fullness of Christ. Then you might say, well, I've not reached that yet. <laughs> Thank you for being honest. Then you need to get with it. And you might say, nobody else in my church has reached that. You're right. So everybody needs to get with it. And the challenge is, in some churches, we're just satisfied with where we are. We shouldn't be satisfied with where we are. We ought to be thankful for what God has done in our lives so far, but we ought to be continuing to press on to greater maturity. In fact, you could think about this. Let's say we stood at the door of the church and we asked um, the average person who was coming to church, why are you coming to the Lord's house today? And hopefully they would say something like this, well, I'm coming to worship my God, I'm coming to pray together with my brothers and sisters in Christ, and then at some point you would want them to say, and I want to hear something from the Word of God that challenges me to grow. I hope the pastor gives me some truth that convicts me. I hope the pastor gives me some truth that equips me. And I want, the reason I came to church wasn't to judge whether I like the special music. It's not to judge whether the pastor gives a good sermon. The reason I came to church was to be challenged myself to grow. And I want to be convicted and I want to be taught how to grow. If you said to the average person who walks in church on Sunday, what are some specific areas in which you tried to grow last week? That man ought to be able to list several things. I'm working on this, and I'm working on this, and I'm working on this. Because I've thought specifically about how I'm unlike Jesus Christ. And then his wife right behind him. And here's some things that I'm working on. And here's some ways that I'm... And not in fuzzy land. We don't change in fuzzy land. But we change in concrete specifics. God is a very specific God. And the Bible is a very specific book. So you would want that husband to be able to list the ways last week that he was trying to grow and what he did about it. The wife ought to be able to do the exact same thing. Then you got all these kitties trailing along behind. Well, they ought to be able to talk about ways that they're trying to change and they're trying to grow. That ought to just be part of our church's DNA. It ought to be part of the way our churches think about themselves then, in the next verse, as a result, we're no longer to be children. You know the sad thing? Some people who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ, 10 years ago, they were childish. Five years ago, they were childish. Last year, they were childish. Last week, they were childish. The fact of the matter is, they're just not growing. And worse than that, that doesn't seem to bother them. They're in a perpetual state of, of, of not growing. It's like when you have children, you don't mind changing their diapers for a while. But you'd sure have a problem if they still, assuming there's no physical problem, uh, you'd st sure have trouble if they're 10 years old and still want to run around in diapers, right? You'd say, we're done with the diaper thing. Well, you know what? Some followers of Jesus Christ, they're still wearing spiritual diapers, there's nothing wrong with having a spiritual diaper on when you're six months old in the Lord. But at some point, you have to take the responsibility to grow. We're no longer children, tossed here and there by waves. 
So all of this has a, a theological underpinning, et cetera, et cetera. Speaking the truth in love. Here it is again. We're to grow up in all. If you took growing out of this passage, there wouldn't be anything left in the passage. And so why is the doctrine, and I think, friends, that the doctrine of progressive sanctification is one of the most neglected doctrines of the day. And yet it's clear all through this passage of Scripture that growth is a normal and an expected part of life. The second reason we've already been alluding to it is because the concept of progressive sanctification is not always emphasized as it should be. You have to decide as a pastor what you're going to emphasize. You have to decide what the major things are going to be in your church family. And if it's not growth, I don't know what it should be. In fact, then you say, well, then how would, I, how would I emphasize that in our church? There's a lot of ways that we try to do it at faith. But one of the ways that we do it is we put this document in the hands of every person who is considering membership in our church. We actually teach a four-week class called Intro to Faith that every person has to go through before they can um, be brought into the membership. And that class is essentially a, um, a question and answer time with me. But it gives me an, an opportunity to get to know them, and it gives me an opportunity to be sure they understand the kind of church that they're joining. And one of the first things that we have in this document is our mission statement. And if you don't have a mission statement for your church, I would strongly encourage you to do that because that's one of the answers to the question, how do I build this mentality into my church body? Our mission statement, and you can do it differently, of course, but our mission statement reads like this. The mission of Faith Church is to glorify God by winning people to Jesus Christ and equipping them to be more faithful disciples. That's what we're all about, outreach and discipleship, discipleship and outreach. That's all what we're about in order to glorify God. And we want every person in our church to understand, this is why I'm part of Faith Church. The, the mission of Faith Church is to glorify God by winning people to Jesus Christ and equipping them to be more faithful disciples. Then, right after that, you can see there's a series of core values. And we want everybody in our church to understand what our core values are. Guess what our, core, our first core value is? Progressive sanctification. Here's the way we say it. Growing stronger, we believe that God has a plan for every Christian's growth and that he wants godly lives and families built. And we just say to every person who's considering membership in our church, do you want to grow? Do you want to change? And do you want a pastor who's going to challenge you week after week after week to grow? Do you want a pastor who's going to equip you week after week um, about how to grow? We're not going to sit around and talk about how bad the world is. Judgment begins at the household of God. So if you want to be part of this church, you have to want to grow. And I realize you might say, well, wait a minute. If we encourage people in our, or if we tell people like this, that um, they're going to be expected to grow if they become part of our church, they may not want to join. To which I would say, fine. We're not trying to be the church for everybody. Because it's possible to get big and to get weak. Do you realize that? It's possible just to be fat as a church, but not to be strong. And I believe you want to grow at a rate that you can faithfully disciple every person who's being one. And I only want folks in our church family who are serious about growing. We had one man, and this... this um, may make sense, it may not, depending on whether you would be familiar with this um, particular story from the United States. But um, you ever heard about Goldilocks and the three bears, and um, she's looking for porridge and it's too cold, and looking for porridge and it's too hot. Does that make any sense at all to anybody here? Goldilocks and the three, <laughs> a, few, uh, a few people. So, so it, it, may, it may not. But, but, but let me tell you what he said, and maybe it'll make sense even if you've not heard the story. We had a man and his family who showed up at our church, and he came for, they came for just a couple of weeks, and then they were gone. And, and honestly, that happens in our town. There's about 120 churches in our community, and many, there's several that are very, very good. And so I don't have any problem with folks who come to our church and then decide they would rather go to another church. God bless them, and th th that's fine. So, so they came for a couple of weeks, and they were gone. And um, then about six months later, they came back, and they stuck 
And so eventually I, I, I got around to asking them, well, what, what happened? And they said, well, the, the husband said to me, when I first came to faith, the porridge was too hot. He said, it burned my tongue. You were constantly talking about how I needed to be a better husband. You're constantly talking about how I needed to be a more godly father. You're constantly talking about how I needed to get to it. In the power of God, you were expecting me to grow. And he said, that burned my tongue. I, I didn't really like that. So he said, we went on a search for porridge that was just the right temperature. And then he said, and, and this is just what he said. I'm not criticizing other churches in our town. But what he said was, what we found is, we, we kept going around, and the porridge was pretty cold. In other words, you could go Sunday after Sunday and you weren't really challenged to grow. You could go and you weren't really expected to grow. You weren't really, you weren't convicted when you went to church. So we kept going around trying to find porridge that was just the right temperature. Then he said this, one day it dawned on me, maybe the problem is my taste for porridge. Maybe I need porridge that's a little bit hot. Maybe I need porridge that's going to burn my tongue from time to time. Maybe I need a pastor that's going to challenge me to grow and expect me to grow and hold me accountable to grow. And they decided that they wanted to be part of our church. And they stayed for a long, long time until God moved them to another community. See, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about a place where progressive sanctification, the sufficiency of the gospel of growth, is actually emphasized Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Now you might say, well, how can you really expect it? That's a good question. Let me just tell you what we do. We have 39 deacons at our church, and our membership is divided up among our deacons. So we have about 1,950 members, and we want our number of members to lag slightly behind the number of people who come on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Because I'm assuming that there are some people who are just visiting who have not yet trusted Christ. But what we don't want, we don't want to have a bunch of people who are members and we don't even know where they are. Nor do we want to have a bunch of people who are faithfully attending and they've not joined our church. In my judgment, both of those extremes are bad. And so we want our membership list to lag slightly behind our average Sunday morning attendance. Now, we divide those 1,950 members up among our 39 deacons. And our deacons are responsible to contact the persons on their list on a regular basis. The deacons are responsible to disciple the people who are on their list. The deacons are responsible, and, and the church members know. The reason I have a deacon is because that's the guy, along with his wife, who's going to be holding me accountable for my growth. That's the guy who's going to be contacting me on a regular basis to be sure that we're heading the right direction. Then at every one of our deacons' meetings, our deacons have to give an account for how many contacts they made that month. And if they're not willing to disciple people, if they're not willing to help them grow, if they're not willing to hold people accountable, they can't be deacons. Because that's one of the primary roles of the deacons in our church. Then three times a year, we go through our entire membership list, name by name. It takes hours, and it makes your head hurt. And we go through every one of our members, and we ask these questions. Do we know where that person is? Do we know how they're doing spiritually? Are they growing? Are they serving? And are we serving them? And if any of the answers to those questions is no, then the next question is, well, then what are we doing to help those persons grow? And if the answer to that is we've done everything we know to do and that person will not change, then regrettably, the next question is, well, where are they in the church discipline process? Because we cannot have people who say they are members of our church and they're not growing. And I realize you might say, wow, if you have that kind of an emphasis on the, the sufficiency of the gospel of growth, some people aren't going to want to join. And that's exactly right. It just, just let's think about this. Think about um, the oversight and accountability in the early church. You remember the church was born in what chapter in the book of Acts? Acts chapter 2. You know that. 
Well, by Acts chapter 5, they had a problem. You remember that problem? Ananias and Sapphira. Remember Ananias and Sapphira? That didn't go very well, did it? And so that was practicing a form of church discipline. Uh, we don't discipline that way today, but, but that was practicing a form. In, in other words, the, the point is, if you're going to say you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you need to take this seriously. If you're going to say you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you don't have to be perfect, but you do have to be the real thing. And Ananias and Sapphira were put to death because they, not because they didn't give the entire amount of the sale of the land to the church, but because they said they did, and they did it. And their lives were taken right then and there. Well, what happened next? Interesting what the scripture says in Acts 5. It says, some people dared not join the church. In other words, they said, I, I just want to play games. I, and if I just want to play games, I don't want to be part of that. Or, well, I know where that trail leads. But it's also interesting, it says, even those people had a whole lot of respect for the church of Jesus Christ. They had a whole lot of respect for people who took their walk with Christ seriously. They had a whole lot of respect for people who were serious about holiness. And God goes on to say, God goes on to say that the Lord constantly added to the number of disciples who wanted to be the real thing. And so a faith, we're not trying to be on the cover of Church Growth Magazine. We're not trying to figure out what are all the ways we can grow as fast as we possibly can. I actually think it's possible to grow too fast. We only want to grow as fast as we can disciple each person who's one. And so I mentioned to you, when we went to faith 28 years ago, there were 400 persons. Now there's 2,000. I'm not saying that, I'm not asking you to say that's good or that's bad, but I'm just saying we believe in slow growth over time. But I know this, I know that we are um, providing oversight for every person who's a member of our church from the perspective of are they growing, are they trying to change also, this is important because the concept of progressive sanctification is not always properly understood. There's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of misconceptions out there about how to grow. For example, if I said the way you grow is by letting go and letting God, would you say amen or would you boo? <laughs> there's a lot of confusion out there. Now, now, I would assume if I got a group of Christians together and I said, you are saved by your works. I assume I, I would be thrown off the platform. I would assume that the average follower of Jesus Christ knows that that is an attack on the gospel of grace. However, we're not nearly as careful when it comes to how to grow. And it's amazing how many ideas are out there about how to grow that are not even remotely consistent with what the Word of God would have to say. Well, why else does this have to be emphasized? It's because the consequences are severe for those who don't grow. See, I don't believe Sunday ought to be a time of entertainment. I don't know about your culture, but in America, the average Christian is already entertained too much already. And so my job is not to come up with more entertainment for Christians. Frankly, there are some times when Christians ought to feel convicted. In fact, last Sunday I spoke on the, the, the topic of conflict resolution. Well, I know that, that many of us are not resolving conflicts in a way that is consistent with Scripture. What does that mean? There ought to be conviction. And not conviction that stops there. Conviction that leads to repentance, that leads to forgiveness, that leads to grace. But there are times in, in church where it's going to be anything but pleasant. But the good news is, when you change, it is pleasant. But, but think about this, Proverbs 28, 13, he who covers his sin shall not prosper. Or Proverbs 15, 13, the way of the transgressor is hard. The bottom line is, there are consequences for not growing. Be not deceived, God's not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And so part of my job is to help our folks live in such a way that they don't have to experience the hardness that comes with the way of the transgressor. Or, fifthly, because spiritual growth glorifies God. Um, I really do believe that as people are growing, as they're changing, that brings great, great glory to God. And then six, because spiritual growth increases our effectiveness in ministering to others. Don't you agree that Ephesians 4.16 is the pastor's dream? I mean, isn't that where we want to be living? What happens when the people in our churches are growing? Here you go, verse 16, from whom the whole body, 
being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Wait, what does that mean? The idea is that every person in the church is growing. And every person is identifying his or her spiritual gift. And every person is being equipped to use that gift well. And then every person in the church is serving. There's something bad wrong with this notion that 90% of the work in the church gets done by 10% of the people. Right? That's bad. It's bad for the 10% who are probably doing too much, and it's bad for the 90% who are not using their spiritual gifts and are not going to be able to give a good account at the judgment seat of Christ. I think part of my job as a pastor is to help people be best prepared to meet the Lord. I like what Warren Wiersbe said about that. He said, as a Christian, I don't fear the fire of hell, but I do fear the fire of heaven. He was alluding to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, what it's going to be like at the judgment seat of Christ, where all of our work is going to be tried by what? By scale? Is it going to be weighed? But by tape measure? No, by what? But by fire. And Scripture says that the way that some followers of Jesus Christ have lived, when it's put to the fire of Christ, is going to, is going to be like wood, hay, and stubble. Poof, gone, no growth, no service, no reward. And God wants it to be, and it can be, like gold, silver, precious stones. But that's only going to happen if individuals are growing and then serving God faithfully. And it's my job. I would rather last Sunday be uncomfortable for some if that's what's necessary in order to help them change and be best prepared for the judgment seat of Christ. But this thing about 90% of the work is done by 10% of the people. Someone has rightly said that the average church on a Sunday morning is too much like a college football game on Saturday afternoon where there's 66,000 people badly in need of exercise watching 22 young men badly in need of rest. And that's the way it is. In many of our churches, it's a spectator sport God's people are not growing, and therefore they're not changing. And we shouldn't say, I'm sorry, they're not growing, therefore they're not serving. We shouldn't say we're an Ephesians 4 kind of church if that is occurring. Now, now for all those reasons, I realize that was just the longest introduction in the history of man. But, but let's, um, eh, hopefully now we say, yes, this is very, very important. Let's work our way through this material. First of all, some important definitions. What do we mean by sanctification? Well, sanctify means to set apart, uh, to be holy, to consecrate to God. John 17, 17, sanctify them in thy truth. Your word is truth. And I'm going to skip some of these passages of Scripture just for sake of time, but I hope you'll note them and read them later. Progressive sanctification, what we're talking about tonight it is the process of a believer growing and changing to become more like Christ in both the inner and the outer man. That's a very, very important definition. And I think every person in our church ought to know the definition of progressive sanctification. There's so many important passages of Scripture. Romans 8, 28 and 29 is such a crucial passage. I hope the members of our church this week we're thinking about ways that they could become more and more like Jesus Christ. Another great sanctification verse is this one. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Don't you love it? These are the last words we have recorded from the um, pen of the Apostle Peter. Did Peter know anything about growing? Did Peter know anything about changing? In fact, one of my favorite preaching series of all times was when I went through the four Gospels... Just highlighting the event with the Apostle Peter, and then we immediately went into the epistle of 1 Peter and 2 Peter and traced all the different ways that God helped him to grow, all the ways that God helped Peter to serve. And isn't it amazing, of everything that Peter could have said as he ended that epistle, what did he talk about? He talked about growing, 
grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen, 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 and amen. Now, setting progressive sanctification in its proper theological context. Obviously, progressive sanctification is preceded by justification. That's why it's so important. I mentioned in our mission statement, the mission of Faith Church is to glorify God by winning people to Jesus Christ. So we're proclaiming the saving gospel of Jesus Christ, but we're equally passionate about proclaiming the sanctifying gospel of Jesus Christ. And so you've got a number of important passages there about that. Now, just in case it's needed, it may or may not be here, you have a definition there of justification, just to be sure we understand that we're not expecting people to change until they first have placed their faith and trust in Christ. We would also want to emphasize this. Progressive sanctification is dependent on our union with Christ and the indwelling Holy Spirit of God. We're talking now about the gospel indicatives. In other words, that's our position in Christ, our union with Christ. I would encourage you to make a distinction in your thinking between the gospel indicatives, who I am in Christ, and the gospel imperatives, what I'm supposed to do for Christ. We're going to be spending a lot of our time um, for the rest of the evening just talking about that. You also have a definition in your notes about our union with Christ and exactly what that means, along with some verses from John 15 and also from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. From the other side of the perspective, progressive sanctification is followed by glorification. And when we'll finally be like Him, for we'll see Him as He is. I mentioned that my wife and I have a special needs son. We we adopted Andrew 22 years ago as a baby. Andrew is blind, and Andrew has a number of abnormalities in the development of his brain. And so even though he's 22 years old, he functions like he's about 8 years old. Well, by God's grace, a couple of years ago, Andrew asked me if he could become a Christian. And we, re- we worked very, very hard not to force that on him. We wanted to be sure that he understood the gospel. And it was just a, a marvelous opportunity, one of the uh, most favorite and treasured memories of my life. I also even have a video of Andrew being baptized at our church. It was such a, a marvelous, marvelous thing. Well, think about having a, a blind, handicapped child who has been justified And by the way, who is working at sanctification, even though he's a special needs handicapped child. But you know the day I'm really looking forward to is the day of his glorification. The day when his eyes are going to be open and he's going to be able to see. And you know what? That may be before I get back to the United States. That we're living in light of the possibility of our glorification. So a a, a summary of this statement. And and I really like this. I would encourage you to note this. One of our other staff members put this together, and I really like what he said. Progressive sanctification is like the middle chapter of a three-chapter book. In the first chapter, you were rescued. You were put in union with Christ through the transforming power of the gospel. You were transferred to God's kingdom. You were given an entirely new mission. The final chapter is where God will make all things right by fulfilling all of His promises. But the middle chapter, this is where we are right now. The chapter on progressive sanctification is fulfilling the mission that God has given to us on this earth. Now, you see that same outline demonstrated in a number of New Testament books. For example, just for sake of time, we could talk about it from the perspective of the book of Ephesians. Where in the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters are all about the gospel indicatives. They're about your identity in Christ. They're about who you are in Christ. Then Ephesians 4 to 6 is all about the gospel imperatives. Now here's the challenge. In fact, here's why we even bring this up. For many of us, we know Ephesians 4 to 6 better than we know Ephesians 1 to 3. In other words, we function more comfortably many times in the commands 
and without always meditating on and understanding the significance of who I am in Christ, what was purchased for me fully and freely at the cross, which makes it possible for me to keep the commands. And it's very important for us, and this is what we're going to talk about, Lord willing, after our break. It's very important for us not to become legalistic in our growth. And part of what helps us avoid moralism or avoid legalism, which is an attack on the gospel, is understanding the balance between the gospel indicatives, my identity in Christ, and the gospel imperatives, what I'm supposed to do as a result. The same is true of Romans. Obviously, it's a longer book, but Romans 1 through 11 is all about the gospel indicatives. And then and only then do we get to chapters 12 through 16, which talk to us about the gospel imperatives. Now, let's talk about some steps. And I want to be very, very careful because we're not saying that, well, this is a cookie cutter and every one of us grows in exactly the same way. And so we help everybody just bonk, 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 bonk. I'm not saying that. But on the other hand, there are some steps. And we ought, in fact, you can think about this. On Sunday morning, if you stood at the door, you're going to be standing at the door of your church a lot, apparently, on Sunday morning. But if you stood at the door of the church on Sunday morning and said to the average person who walks in, tell me how a person changes, what do you think your church member would say? Tell me how a person grows. What would they say? Or if you said, listen, I have Joe standing right next to me. He's struggling with sinful anger. Can you go sit down with Joe and help him change in his sinful anger? Or we said, Here, here's um, Sue, and she's struggling with uh, pornography on the Internet. Could you please sit down with Sue and help her begin to change in that area of her life? What I'm asking is, how many of the people in our churches really understand how to grow? Uh, they have some sort of a working knowledge of the doctrine of progressive sanctification. Now, if the answer to that is, well, not many, now be careful, sit back. Whose fault is that? Certainly not the poor Americans, right? <laughs> it's not, so if it's not mine, then whose might it be? Yeah, that would be the responsibility of the shepherds. This is a shepherds conference, right? And so it's the, would you agree with me? Some of you are looking like that offended you a little bit. So could you give me a, a little bit of, and don't answer for yourself. I know your church is perfect. But answer for, answer for the person sitting around you. I mean, whose responsibility is it to help the members of our church know how to grow? In fact, the, the man who mentored me, our former senior pastor, taught me this. Many times the major problem is with the major prophet. Do you know what he meant by that? Could you smile at me by that just a little bit? Many times, the major problem is with the major prophet. You can decide what you think about that. Now, what are some key steps um, for how to grow? Well, remember the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit. You understand none of this is man-centered. It would be terrible to suggest that anything regarding the gospel did not involve the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's not by might. It's not by power, but by thy spirit. And so we could talk for a long, long time about the place of the Holy Spirit in the sanctification process. Also this, that remember that all change has to originate in the heart. And I've tried to emphasize that in many ways. Hopefully, if we connected one of our church members with someone struggling with anger, the person wouldn't just talk with them about behavior. They would talk about the heart that produces angry behavior. If they were working with someone on Internet pornography, the answer wouldn't be throw your computer out the window. That might be part of the answer. But, but ultimately, the problem is not the computer. The problem is the heart that wants things out of the computer. It, it, it's just like this. If we knock this water bottle like this, eventually there's going to be water on the floor. Well, why is there water on the floor? You could say, well, because you knocked it. No, an equally compelling answer to that question is there's water on the floor because there was water in the bottle. And had there been coffee in the bottle, there would be coffee on the floor. And so I can't blame my life on all the... It's not, well, there's too much alcohol in this world. 
or there's these computers, or Al Gore inventing the internet. And I realize you probably don't even know what that means, and that's, that was an attack that I'm probably going to have to ask forgiveness for, but since you don't understand it, I don't have to ask forgiveness. But anyway, <laughs> the problem is not the internet. That's what I meant to say. Oh, my, my, my. So, so the point is, before I got off of my notes there just a little bit, the point is that all change originates in the heart. And so you have a number of passages of Scripture that I'm just going to skip for sake of time. Now, I would encourage you to um, highlight this next one, star this next one. Through prayer and study of the Word, identify specific areas that need to change the most. In fact, if, if I were in your shoes, if you say, you know, I'm not sure our church family understands progressive sanctification the way they should, well, what do you think you ought to do? I'd be teach, teaching an extended series on how to change and grow. That's one of the beautiful things about being the pastor. You get to decide what you're studying, right? And no, one's, no one has a gun to your head. We're studying Habakkuk. Right? You get to decide. And if you're not sure that your church family understands gospel-centered sanctification, I would encourage you to do a series on that. And the goal is, a month from now, two months from now, Every person in our church would have a specific list of, here's the ways I'm least like Christ. Here's the ways I'm least pleasing to God, and therefore here's the areas of my life in which I'm working to change and become more and more like Christ. And it needs to be as precise as possible. It needs to be as specific as possible. Now, some of those areas, and there's many, but one would be speech. Many of us are unlike Jesus Christ in the way we speak. And so one of the ways that are one of the areas in which sanctification needs to occur is in our speech. There's no question that also um, we need to change in our actions or our behavior. And you might say, well, I thought you didn't emphasize behavior. Oh, we emphasize behavior to the degree that it's emphasized in the Bible. But we don't emphasize behavior apart from the heart. There's also the need to change in our thinking. A lot of the sanctification process occurs in our hearts or our minds. And by the way, you understand when we say hard, we're not talking about the blood pumper. We're talking about the inner man. The word hard is used over 700 times in the Bible. And it's very, very important to understand what the Scripture says about the heart and to help the followers of Jesus Christ that we're discipling work at changing at the level of the heart. That's also true of motivation. Why do I do what I do? And James 4, 1 to 2 is such an important passage of Scripture. I would also encourage you to jot down next to that one, James 1, 14 and 15. Every man is tempted to sin when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. There it is, lust, desires. And the principle there is, find out what you're wanting. Find out what you habitually want so much that you sin in order to get it, or you sin when you don't get it. You found one of the greatest stumbling blocks to your sanctification. You found an area that often needs to be addressed before you're going to really change. So you've made a whole list of, here's the ways I'm least like Christ. What do I do next? It's time to repent. In fact, you could ask, here's another question at the church house door. It's going to be, Sunday's going to be a long day for you. Um, you could also ask, when is the last time you repented of anything? When's the last time you asked forgiveness for anything? And do you realize a number of people who came through the door of the church house would not be able to answer that question? They couldn't tell you the last time they repented. They couldn't tell you the last time they asked forgiveness for anything. What's that tell you? It tells you they're not growing. It tells you they're not taking the doctrine of progressive sanctification nearly as seriously as they can or as they should, asking forgiveness from God and from the appropriate people. And then what do you do next? You say, okay, I've identified a number of areas of the inner man and the outer man that need to change. What do I do next? Well, what do I do next is I need to mortify it. 
I need to put that to death. That habit of thinking, it needs to die. That habit of speaking, it needs to die. That habit, and when's the last time you hated something about your inner or outer man that was unlike Jesus Christ that you consciously sought to put that to death? It's like a woman in the United States named Nell Ham. This is a true story. It's one of the problems of preaching now that people have smartphones. They can actually check out your illustrations. But this actually happened in the United States. This woman, Nell Ham, was a retired woman. And she and her husband, Jim, loved, lived up in the northwest part of our country. And they were taking a walk along a mountain trail. All of a sudden, they were uh, attacked by a mountain lion. And this mountain lion jumped on Jim, Nell's husband, knocked him to the ground, and had Jim's head in its mouth. Now, thankfully, because the mountain lion's mouth was so extended, it really couldn't crush. So it just had her husband's head in its mouth. So Nell Ham, this older, retired woman, had to decide what she was going to do in that situation. You know what Nell Ham did? She grabbed a log and she started beating the fire out of this mountain lion. She's going to kill this mountain lion. Well, the mountain lion still had its head on Jim, or its mouth on Jim's head. So believe it or not, Google this later. It really did happen. Uh, Jim, though the mountain lion had his head in its mouth, could still talk. And so Jim says to Nell, put the log down. There's an ink pen in my pocket Take the ink pen and smash it in the mountain lion's eye. So you know what Nell did? She, she put down the log. She took the ink pen out of her husband's pocket. She smashed it in the mountain lion's eye so hard that the pen actually broke in half. But the mountain lion still did not release its grip from Jim's head. So you know what Nell Ham did next? Nell Ham did what any good wife would do. She picked the log back up, and she started beating the fire out of the mountain lion some more. And finally, the mountain lion released its grip from Jim's head, turned around, looked right at Nell, then turned around and walked up the mountain path. Smartest decision that mountain lion made all day long. Now, seriously, you can Google that story, but the point is Nell Ham was working as hard as she could to kill that mountain lion because of the damage it was doing to her husband. When's the last time you had something in your life, in either the inner or the outer man, that was damaging your testimony, that was damaging your relationship with Christ, and you hated it so bad that you were doing everything in your life to put it to death. That's what's required in the power of the Holy Spirit in order to change. So choose to, to mortify your sin. And you've got a great series of passages about that. Then choose to replace those sinful ways of thinking and acting with godly alternatives. And I'm out of time, but if time allowed us to, we could talk about the putting off and the putting on process, the principle of replacement. And you have all sorts of examples there in your notes about where that concept is emphasized and why it's, in fact, last Sunday, I actually had a put off, put on chart up on the PowerPoint screen for the members of our church, and I was walking them through step by step in order to change in this particular area. Here's what has to be put off. Here's what has to be put on. And you say you're kind of walking people through like they're immature. That's exactly right. We have a lot of new believers in our church. And by the way, we should. Because the point is, if you've got people who are growing spiritually, they're going to be dramatically different than the people in their culture, which is going to attract people to the light, and they're going to constantly be winning people to Jesus. And so you're constantly adding more and more people. You're adding water to the soup, is the point. Which is why, even after all these years, we keep having to emphasize progressive sanctification and emphasize progressive sanctification. And you might say, well, what about the people in the church who have heard this like a hundred times? Remember, Peter did not apologize for repeating biblical truth to God's people. And I don't either. And truths like this need to be um, rehearsed over and over and over again.
also learn to um, practice the spiritual disciplines. I didn't start with the spiritual disciplines because I wouldn't want someone to think that, well, you just read your Bible and you pray every day and you'll grow, grow, grow. But obviously I'm for reading the Bible and I'm for praying, and that's a part of the growth process. Now seek to continue to glorify God and enjoy the blessings of following Him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, if you say, well, how could we picture this process? Well, you have a diagram there in your notes that, that kind of helps us picture this. And I have a little laser on my pointer, and it's always dangerous to give a man a laser. But, but here's the way this works. Remember when you first came to Christ? Remember that day? You, you were growing like a weed, weren't you? You were learning more and more truth, and you were excited about the things of God, and you were changing. There was a dramatic difference in your life, but then, bam! You fell into sin in some way. No one told you that after you came to Christ, you still would struggle with sin. And so that resulted in guilt. And so you start heading back down. But hopefully then you learn some additional truth. You learn how to move out of that sin. You learn that it was going to be a process. And now you're heading back up. In fact, you're actually higher than you were before. And then, bam, there's a trial. Nobody told you there was going to be a trial after you came to trust Christ as Savior and Lord, and then you went back down, but hopefully you learned some additional truth and you continued to grow. And the point of this diagram is that the Christian life is not a straight line. It's not always going up. God does not expect perfection, but He does expect us to be growing. And I would encourage you to think about, now, that we talk about the gospel in our churches, when we talk about the gospel, are we talking about it in its um, biblical sufficiency? It's not just something that saved me in the past. It's not just something that's going to get me to heaven in the future. It's also a gospel that transforms my life in the here and now. And that ought to be part of our church's DNA. I'll also say this to you. I realize some of you, this whole thing about counseling I've tried not to overuse the word counseling for a variety of reasons. But I'll tell you something that we often say to our church family. We'll say, after a discussion like this, now if you have some questions about how to specifically apply this in your life, or how to specifically apply this in your marriage, me and some of the other pastors or some of the other people who have been trained in our church are going to be available on, let's say, Thursday night, and would be more than happy to talk with you individually or as a couple about that. Or if you would rather get together for a cup of coffee, if, if you're more comfortable with that. Or if you would rather I came out to your home or someone came to your home and talked with you about this. To apply this practically, we're more than happy to do that. We also say to folks, now, if you have some friends who are struggling... And they might be helped by hearing some things from the Word of God. We have some individuals who are trained, and we'd be more than happy to help. Because here's what we don't want to do in sanctification. We don't want to just talk about what people are to be like. We also want to provide the resources to help each one of us change and grow. Well, let's pray together, shall we? Father in heaven, thank you for the joy of sanctification. Thank you that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Lord, thank you for this delightful goal of us becoming more and more like Christ, of us becoming more and more pleasing to Him. And Father, maybe for some of us, we're not so much thinking about sanctification for others. We're thinking about sanctification for ourselves. And maybe this hasn't been emphasized in our own hearts and lives the way it should be. So Father, I pray that if that's the case, I pray that you would help us to do business with you and do business with our families or those who know that we've not been growing the way we should have. And then, Father, you've called many of us to be shepherds. Yeah, what a marvelous, marvelous privilege that is. Lord, I pray that you would help us to teach our persons, to teach our people to grow, to lovingly hold them accountable for growth, to help them be best prepared to give a good account at the judgment seat of Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.